special bonus episode of Evolve with 3Share. Uh, I'm Peyton Henry, 3Share's marketing specialist. Uh, last week, we talked about generative AI and AEM. And with so much to cover, we decided to add a second part to finish out our discussion. Our same panelists are here, but in case you didn't tune into part one yet, I'll let them introduce themselves, uh, starting with Gordon. Hi, I'm Gordon Pike. I'm a, a technical architect at 3Share. I've been here, uh, I believe it's nine years now, um, worked on, on quite a few things. I've got 30 years of experience. I've worked with uh, some expert systems with uh, McKesson Healthcare and Sandy and National Lab. And, and so uh, it, a broad breadth of experience. Cool. Um, I guess I can go next. Uh, my name is Clemente. I'm the of technology for Threshold. I uh, have been here working as a, previously as a developer, technical architect at Threshold. Um, I'm based in Madrid, though I'm from Argentina, as you maybe can tell from my accent. Um, yep, yeah, I guess that's, that's it. Okay, thank you. My name is Jorge. I'm a backend developer. I've been for uh, for half a year here from, in Threshold. Um, well, I'm also from Madrid, as Clemente, but I'm from Spain, not from Argentina. <laughs> cool, and I'm Robbie Akun. I'm the um, senior marketing manager at 3Share, but prior to that, I was a project manager for quite a few years. Um, I've been with 3Share for about seven years, and I'll just uh, fess up and say I am in London, United Kingdom, but from the United States, so you might not think much of my accent, but they definitely do in the streets of London. So. <laughs> Thanks, I everybody. do notice that. <laughs> <laughs> For me, the British accent is, is hard to understand. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> they need uh, a cockney accent, right? <laughs> uh, if you guys missed uh, the first part, you can view it now at uh, freesharecorp.com slash evolve or on our YouTube channel. Um, to recap what we did last week, Jorge showed some features that he and Clemente had developed in AEM, giving an idea of what's possible. They generated text metadata, tweets, and image metadata, and then they ran through AI tools, the cost of using AI, and development best practices. Um, this week's discussion will be led by Rabia, and it will continue that now. Um, I'll be posting poll questions in the chat, and um, if you have any questions throughout, you can also post them in the chat. And I'll just hand it over to Rabia now. Cool. Thanks, Peyton. Hey guys, so welcome back to this week um, to Evolve again. So I'm really excited that we get to continue our discussion of AI, partly because I'm learning a lot, but also um, I think it's just interesting information for everyone. So last time, like Peyton mentioned, you guys did show uh, proof of concept and showed other things as well that you've either built or been observing that's going on online. So um I think, especially in building the POC, but otherwise you probably made some considerations or there are considerations people should make when adding AI into their content management system or even any um, technological ecosystem that they have. So I just wanna learn more about that and what you think people should be thinking of. Um, so why don't we just start with you, Gordon? Sure, yeah. So uh, yeah, straight from, from chat GPT itself, it, it, it was trained back in September of 2021. So if there's, any current information, um, it, it doesn't have access to that. So for instance, uh, with coding languages, if there's uh, there's been, obviously there's been a lot of changes since then. And if it's developing any code, it's going to to use an older version of, of those uh, those tools. It, uh, you know, the, the data, keeping these up to date, it, it, it takes a larger footprint. So where they're, so where it takes a lot of energy is in training these data sets. And, and uh, I believe the, uh, the set for chat GPT, I, I think they've, they spent $800,000 to train that. And really there's, uh, I just saw today, there's a, a uh, set of uh, an open source program. You can, you can actually use, uh, train a data set for 47,000. So th those costs are going down, but the energy consumption is, um, can be large at times. The The reason for that is uh, most of the training happens with a GPU rather than the CPU, you know, CPU central processing unit. And that's what is in, in most normal, um, most normal uh, computers. A GPU is what's 
what's used to, to drive your video process. It's a video processor. And those are used heavily in, in uh, mining, mining uh, Bitcoin, but they're also really heavily used in training AI. The difference is the uh, CPU can take 80 watts of power, where a GPU takes 300 watts. A lot of the, the machines that are used for training AI can have up to eight GPUs rather than one, one single CPU. <clears throat> There's also new things like uh, the TPU, the tensor um, processing unit put out by Google, and they, they have LPUs as well, where you can actually embed a language processor in your own embedded systems. So the, the, all of these are, you know, all of these actually made it easier for us to adopt AI, but it's also taking a lot more energy to do that. Wow, that's, yeah, that's incredible. I mean, just thinking about energy consumption, and of course, then you think about yeah. the environment and and yeah, they, <laughs> yeah, Elon Musk did an interview and, and they were talking about, uh, you know, he's talking about the being cautious with AI and, and being able to stop it. And the interviewer said, well, how would you stop it? He said, well, you look for the, the hot points. You look to where the grid is being, you know, where the most data, the power has been pulled. And those are the, the targets that you would hit to, to bring down AI. Wow. Well, I... We're not going to get into <laughs> to that part today, <laughs> but um, there could be some some climate warriors interested in that for sure. And then, yeah, and then the other point around um, how current the information is. So th those are really great points. And then does anyone else have anything to add, things, considerations that either you made or you might make if you were going to be incorporating AI? Yeah, I, I think uh, together with having that into account about the debate, of the information that it has. That's uh, for ChatGPT, but usually it works like that. I mean, usually when you have, you are using a AI and you're using a model that you have either trained or you maybe you get it pre-trained, you need to have that in mind that it's a, a model. It's not like it gets automatically updated like every single day. So that's one for sure thing that we need to have into account together with um, like, it's not something that you will get and it will be just copy paste. So that I think would be the first thing I would say to someone who wants to implement AI to produce content. I think that's the first thing it's about. You need to know that it may make errors. I mean, there may be errors in the, in the output, in the content that it create, and maybe it has some bias too. So those, the first thing to know is that everything is not copy paste. And you need to know how to, you need to proofread that. And of course, if we're talking about companies, if we're talking about marketing, of course, we are thinking about the tone, like how that content is produced. So you also have that, you need to take that in mind that if you are creating and producing content, typically you want like, you want that to look similar to what you have been produced. So it doesn't look fake uh, for your uh, web visitors. Um, but of course, there are techniques, there are ways to do that, where there are ways to kind of teach, like double air quotes, like teach the model how you talk, how your company talks, and, and maybe even incorporate more things. Like if you're pharmaceutical, you can incorporate more language, or brown health, for example. And there are mitigation points, of course. But from the get going, I would say just be careful and, and proofread everything. That's a and that's a good advice anyway. I mean, I certainly advice that I probably could use every once in a while is proofread everything, <laughs> right? But yeah, that's interesting, Clemente, and just kind of, you know, three share. We have a voice, for example, that we're trying to always evoke, and and if some bot writes something, it's probably not going to um, going to be doing that. And even even in this call, I mean, we could have if we script out every single thing we're gonna say, we're gonna miss interesting banter like this, right? So. Yeah. It's not gonna think that way. So what about you, Jorge? What about, you were involved yeah, in Yeah, I want to mention, uh, going back to the, the GPUs versus CPUs processing, I want to point it out that uh, recently, a few, I think two months ago, one month ago or so, uh, DeepMind, which uh, released Alpha Fold, I'm not sure if uh, anyone knows that, it's like an, uh, an AI for folding the molecules, which apparently is a process uh, super heavy 
uh, cost and they implemented an, an AI. They built uh, Alpha Tensor, uh, which basically learn how to operate uh, matrices in a faster way than we know right now. So imagine if we have like 20 steps right now, maybe they, they manage to operate matrices with, with 15 steps instead of 20. So I think that's a, a great point of a start in terms of, of energy usage, because you can use that model to optimize, for example, uh, okay, I want to operate uh, matrices, but I want to optimize the energy use. So I can, maybe I can increase my, my time spend, but at the end of the day, I can improve my, my energy and save costs in that. And I think it's, it's worth mentioning because maybe we can see some something in the future going over there. Because right now we are in the step of optimizing mm -hmm. all the technology and all the infrastructure. Yeah. Well, and that's good. I mean, because a lot of companies, when you look at sustainability, things that they're yeah. they're doing now is really in order for them to continue operating in the future, they need to make sure that the way they're operating is responsibly. So I, I almost think it's weird if there's something new coming out technology wise or just a new business model or something that doesn't take that into account now. It's not, you know, the 70s, <laughs> basically. Yeah. It's like we are moving to, to electric cars, but we are spending yeah. our, <laughs> our contamination in other ways. <laughs> yeah, we know that there's... The balance is, is there. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone on this call at least understands that there's there's like an issue. So, okay, that's, yeah, that's great stuff, guys. So what about looking at coding and development? I mean, I, I know probably anyone, any developer who's listening certainly has dealt with someone like me who's decided that they know how to code all of a sudden when they don't. And, and then I think um, on projects, and then I think like people just, you know, going online and changing themselves to look like a superhero or typing a question at a chat B GPT or being like, Oh, write this person a message for me or something all of a sudden thinks that they know what they're doing, but it's really complicated, I think. And, and it's more complicated than just saying, Hey, write this message for me. So um, from a development perspective, what do you, what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, it, it, it's all about the prompts. It, to, to get what you want out, you need to be able to, to describe what you want. The more detailed you can in your description, the better the output could be. It's for uh, using chat GPT as a developer, you can, uh, it can be very, it can be beneficial, but in, in snippets, you, you, I think there's an expectation that you could just, Tell it, hey, I, I need a website that has 20 pages to be able to sell vape pens or you know whatever it is, and, and that it would spit out the entire code the way that it needs to be done with all you know security and things. And that's simply not true. But where it does really come in handy is where you may uh, you may not be as familiar with a piece of code, or you may want some scripts. Well, for instance, the other day I I wanted uh, you know. Sometimes you need to write a bash script to, to be able to manipulate some files and it, it can take you a few hours to do that, but you could ask G, GPT, chat GPT for that and then modify that to, you know, so it can take a lot of the mundane tasks and, and make those better. In using Copilot, it, it really shines like, for instance, where you're testing your code. So to be able to, to come up with data quickly, it can do some of those calculations. You wouldn't have to go to Google and, and search and, and, and then do that. You, it can be right there and uh, you know save time that way. But it's, it's at least not right now, it, you can't get a full fledged application out of it that you would be, that you'd, that you'd find performant and, and ready for production. And then, yeah, and then to your point too, it would only be current as current as the information yeah that's true yeah yeah so any new languages that come out you you wouldn't be able until they go and retrain you wouldn't be able to take advantage of those and and they 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 evolve as fast as almost as fast as ai does yeah mm -hmm. yeah I and mean, you guys are constantly learning something new and then trying it out and mm -hmm. then it. and i'm sure that's part of the exciting part of the job but also yeah, and it's the same thing with the design. So you can you can actually uh, like in Mid Journey, you can pop out some pretty good starting points for design. But the question is, when there's a new latest thing, you know, 
does it know it it doesn't know what that is and so the designs will be will start getting long in the tooth and until they're they're able to to re recalibrate their their models yeah that makes sense and what about you guys is anything else to add um clemente or jorge since you've been working with it um my god just my personal experience working with called whisper which is the other one i mean one is called pilot that is for open from open ai i think right um i think yeah, it is. yeah it's Right, and call, uh, Whisper is from AWS, and it's free on an individual basis. Um, I don't know, I guess it's right now for me, it's just a matter of get used to, and the most important thing is like what Gordon said, it's all about the prompts. You need to know how to use it. It's not magic, for sure. That's yeah, yeah, it's similar to in our, for example, in, in technology, we usually search everything in Google, like, we search, you use Google a lot, and we have this special technique to know exactly how to query in Google. Yeah, right. Like we know how to search that, but this is similar. It's another way of searching. So mm. it's, it's actually just a try and error, and you will end up learning how to interact with that. That's yeah. that's true. Like, and it it sounds dumb, but like I'm pretty good at Google to be honest, and some people are not, and it, it amazes me. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> but even like, I was just thinking now of like that, let me Google that for you, that site, you know, and you send people the link. <laughs> so I want to see yeah. what, if this happens, <laughs> you let me prompt that for you. Um, yeah, basically. <laughs> are you going to become a prompt engineer now? I, hey, yeah. I might. I, might. I, I could become a provoking engineer probably. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what about just like thinking about content usage and implications of that? Because I don't know, just someone who I write a lot either – outside of work or at work. And, um, you know, I have to be careful, for example, of like not writing someone, writing a joke and then pretending it's mine, it's not mine. Or if I'm doing things out, like comedy outside of work or at work, I want to, if I'm writing a blog or working with one of you guys on a blog, I want to make sure we're not quoting someone else's blog. And, you know, we cite resources and stuff like that, you know, so as a human, you're very careful with content. So, um, are there implications? Because we saw you guys generate text already. We saw you guys generate metadata for images, but also we've um, Gordon showed how he went. And if you didn't tune in last time, you can see Gordon as Fabio. So, looking at all that, all that stuff, um, what are content implications that people should think about? I mean, yeah, that brings up a great point because there's a lot of tools that are coming out. Um, you know, there's a, there's always been some plagiarism tools, but now there are tools to, to identify if a, a section of text is AI generated or not. And you usually get a probability or, you know, some range of confidence that it's human generated or AI generated. On the flip side of that, then the AIs are getting smarter and trying to trying to write that, um, you know, write copy that's that doesn't, it doesn't uh, look like it's been AI generated. But uh, the whole thing, so they, they they were trained on, like for instance, Chat GPT was trained on a lot of public data and some some uh, private data that is that it had access to. So it's it's all been um, so the chances of you, what you're writing um, is based on somebody else's work, and a lot of people are now starting to to say, well, like for instance, Reddit changing. They want to make sure their content's not used, um, or that if it is, that they, they get some kind of retro, some kind of uh, compensation for that. Um, Twitter, for instance, they're they're doing the same thing that that uh, you know Elon's threatened to, to sue because uh, some of those models were trained on Twitter information. But uh, as you use it and in, in, in practical guidance, you can you can start with what what uh, AI is generated, but then use that to to prompt yourself and what you what you want to do. You can change it and modify it. Um, part of the the uh, detectors they're looking for patterns that that happen frequently in text that's been generated by AI. And so it's it's you 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 don't want to take what what comes from AI and slap that on your website. You always want to take that and run it through the filter that. Of of your own, and and make it your own. It, there's, you know, security. We're going to see a lot of 
ways that it can be used for um, security. You know, if you develop some code, you can take a look and make sure that you don't have any holes there and stuff. Nice. And yeah, and I mean, that, and that reminds me of kind of what Clemente was talking about a little bit ago too, just kind of with the tone and, and learning stuff like that. But also, I mean, students are trying to write papers, right? Mm -hmm. With, um, and I've even heard about that, like at um, a school, just kids got caught, you know, and then no, no. already building software to, to um, uh, combat that as well. I wish I had, <laughs> honestly, it would have been useful right now to have chat GPT tell, tell me what to say, because it would have gone mm -hmm. a little bit smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, there's there's multiple ways to use it, like in a, in a train in a uh, teaching space, and you know, the the bad part is somebody being able to write their paper with it, but the, the good mm. part is uh, like a personal t tutor. So yeah. if if a student's trying to to delve into something new, ChatGPT can be like the tutor and help them at their own pace and and their own learning um, mm. trail. It's how do you yeah, how do you police yeah. that? Yeah, I actually used ChatGPT to learn a little bit of Python at the beginning of Lois IA. Ah. I just uh, questioned ChatGPT about the terms I was looking for. After that, obviously, I I contrasted the information, but mm. for the very for the start point, it's pretty good actually. And yeah, you can, uh, most of the time, it's actually information is very accurate. Mm. Yeah. Specific, yeah. Specifically, if you talk about that technicism, mm. if you want to talk about more life, uh, day of layer or something like that, maybe it's more more random and maybe hallucinate, which is basically uh, it invents the, the information. But mm. I was just thinking about the um, these content checkers, or I don't know how we call them, like this software that tells you, okay, this is AI created or not, and about the teaching space. I think the, the good side of this, if people or teachers, like the society can take advantage of it, is like, uh, what I'm going is that probably we don't have to worry about how to detect that a student is, teach, is cheating with AI, but there's the chance that we are challenging the, the teaching and all the education system to ask the right question, give the kids the right task the right homework so they have to think. I mean, there's no way that AI will think for you. So I found that really interesting that the next challenge for, for the, just like, I don't know, when calculator comes up, like came up, I don't know, but find a way that you give something for the kids so they can think and you don't have to worry, oh, maybe they use GPT. So let's not ask them, make an essay about Abraham Lincoln. I don't know, that's kind of dumb nowadays, you know, it's something easily can be cheated yeah. on. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Like, what's the summary of this book? Well, I mean, Gordon, like we, I would say like, if we look at, back at Cliff's Notes, right, or something like, there was Cliff's Notes, so it was these yellow and black cover book covers and they would show like the whole book like what happened really quickly and people would just use that instead of a book and then now it's this and right. yeah yeah exactly but it's just kind of like yeah ask something else other than what's the summary because that's not interesting anyway mm. usually it's just like so that's a good exactly. point, so when you go into teaching let us know yeah i will think about it but, but even you guys have to do that i'm just thinking about i'm deviating but it's okay um because i'm doing it so i don't mind but like when you think about interview questions, right? And um, when you're interviewing people to work at a company, I mean, we worked very hard here to get questions that tell us what something about the person, not just have them recite software names or just recite mm. whatever. And then you guys, when you put together like the tests or whatever, you're not doing something that they could just go look up really quick, right? You're right. You know, yeah. yeah. So. And sometimes you, you even hear people typing you know, <laughs> it yeah, happened yeah. to me, I think once or twice, like you ask something and another side is like typing sounds like, <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, I mean, it's all about getting the right question, I think. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, so this is really broad, but um, just in general, I mean, because you guys have been thinking about this quite a bit and 
uh, um, just for this, but also just, I think, cause you're all people that I, my experience with all of you is that you're all very curious and you are always learning new things anyway, but what do you guys think about just in the future? It's a pretty broad question, but what things are you either looking forward to and exciting, excited about, or maybe just see coming just in your opinion? Of course, none of us are experts. Let me say that. And, and we're not saying we know the future, but you know, um, yeah. I, mean, I guess it, it, it kind of goes to, so in the 90s, if you wanted to start a new company, you had to look for investors because you're going to, you're going to spend, you know, you're going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on getting your infrastructure in place and getting licenses. Like if you were writing a web service, you'd, you'd be uh, web logic or something that, you know, anyway, there was a lot of, a lot of barriers to entry. And then, those barriers have been going down as we as we go on with Amazon Web Services and being able to, um, you know, use that as you know platform as a service and and whatnot. So you can a, a small um, a small company can look like a large company now. I think that's I think this is the next step of that because you can now use ChatGPT as a as an MBA uh, consultant for your for your small business or it, it could be, you know, it shouldn't be giving you legal advice, but you could actually get some guidance and, and you know, and there's things where you would normally have to go outside of your, your one or two person shop and, and get uh, help where you can get that now. Um, so that's, that's where it's the leverage. I think that it gives you, that's what's exciting um, because now somebody that something that used to take, take a lot of money and a lot of time, and uh, people behind it now can be done with a, a few focused, you know, a smaller focus group. Yeah. Anyone else? A little long winded, but. No, but yeah, I mean, that's a good point. And even I do like the advice not to get legal advice from ChatGPT. I can't imagine <laughs> going to court and being like, oh, <laughs> this is where I heard. You yeah. Know? Yeah. But do you I thought on ChatGPT, it must be true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now we are going to see in every blog a source to the bit. Twitter used to be the source of truth, and now it's yeah. <laughs> Twitter are already the source now it's the bit. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jorge? Um, what do you think? Uh, well, uh, I think well, right now the the AIs are just tools. You have to to learn how to use. We will eventually reach the AGI, you know, the, the general artificial intelligence, but I think it takes a while. Basically, because right now, even though we call intelligence and ChatGPT generates uh, the text like perfect, even better than some, some humans, we just teach him how to fake being intelligent. That's the, the key of, the, of what are, we are actually doing right now. There is no really intelligence there. We just teach them with tons of, and tons of data how to behave against a problem. In this case, it's, it's text. But for example, um, uh, there is other problems like computer vision, where you simply use uh, Google also for the, this, this service, where you want to identify objects in, in an image. For example, uh, there were many, pro a friend of mine working in a project for, uh, during COVID where he identified a group of, of people in, in a video frame where they were just uh, two together. Like they had to keep the distance and they uh, record the, the rectangle, identify that. And that's another uh, a completely different different problem. And this field is also going to, to improve a lot because uh, a meta from Facebook uh, release a, a new model called Segment Anything that I think is brilliant. Basically, you give him an image and it will split in different masks. It's called like instead of rectangles, it's like pixel perfect alignment. Everything in that image. Back in the day, we had to do this manually, uh, mm -hmm. providing the either the mask or at the rectangle position, like X, Y, and the width and height. Yeah. And you have to do that manually in order to achieve a classification of kind of flowers, dogs, uh, identify the cats or whatever you want. 
with this tool right now, everything is going to be faster than ever because you can use uh, the you push the image to the to the service, you cut the mask, and you say, okay, this is uh, cut, and you level it manually. But you already have the mask, which is the harder part already already built, which I think it's awesome. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Well, and in terms of, of text, uh, we are talking about ChatGPT, but there is always other, let's call, proficient models that are live right now. And again, uh, Meta release the uh, Llama, which is under, uh, you can only use it if, if it's for research man. You cannot use commercial use of that. Right. But mm -hmm. for example, with this ChatGPT, we can generate tons of information valuable information probably better than we can find in reddit twitter or whatever because it is already trying to output some information in the way that there are no that direct biases or errors or something like that and actually this was uh, achieved thanks to the, the stanford university they built uh, a model called alpaca on top of llama and they use uh, 52K instructions from ChatGPT. They cost like 600 euros or, or dollars. And they train this, this llama with this data set from ChatGPT and, and get better results even than yeah, ChatGPT. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they, they got less, they use less data, but they were able to get better results. Yeah, yeah because they can make it's it, valuable data, they can actually, it, yeah. right? And um, this is also with, we can start even using uh, AA generative images to start training. We don't longer have to take the photos ourselves. We can start generating the data sets where we are training the information. Well, yeah, but do you, Clemente, I was gonna ask about photos, but did you wanna say something first or no? Um, no, 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 I mean, Go ahead with, with photos. I don't want okay. to change topic. I like that topic. Okay. Yeah. Well, photos are, I think, I mean, photos are a place that I think is interesting. One one thing I heard just along the lines of recognizing people um, at Madison Square Garden in New York, and I don't know if you guys have been there, but it's huge. And they were, there was this like law firm that was involved in some, some case. And basically MSG decided that those lawyers can come to the garden if they have tickets for a show or something. I heard this on the New York Times podcast and like basically then they would facial recognize the people and then it would not let them in. <laughs> I mean, it's not like, I don't know. It's just fun. like I'm laughing not because I think it's like great, but it's just like crazy to me, right? Like they can't mm -hmm. come in because it's just recognized. Nope, that person's not allowed in. And so that was interesting, but there's a lot of other implications with photos, right? I mean, you can manipulate photos, but also like what are right. So I don't know, Clemente, mm -hmm. do you want to talk a little bit about that? Maybe I know Gordon, we talked yeah. about yeah, sure. I have something really quickly to show. Uh, talking about photos and, and talking about the future, actually, we can connect kind of two points. Um, <clears throat> because we have, uh, I read, I think, a couple of weeks about um, a guy who posted on Reddit. This guy was working on playing around with Mid Journey since the beginning. Mid Journey, you know, is an AI uh, kind of oriented on, on images generation. And they did this. Uh, the, this guy used exactly the same prompt to generate something on April 2021, which would be in version one of Midjourney, and used the same one again this year. So as you can see, very basic prompt. It's like 35-year-old, serious Pakistani woman, look at the camera. The setting is a village, photorealistic, natural lighting, and a few more like parameters. And well, I mean, I don't have anything to say here because you can you can see it's amazing how it evolved from just 12 years. I don't know, 12 yeah. years, I wish, uh, 12 months. It's crazy. And there's another one, it's another example here, same setup, like similar prompt or well, almost exactly the same prompt except for the last parameters. We don't know like specific for the version, but it's pretty much amazing how you can even tell that the, the second one is AI generated. No, it's yeah, uh, that's amazing. And uh, finally, now we're talking about yeah, not. Yeah. What's Sorry. What's funny is uh, in order to detect AI now, now you got to look for imperfections. You know, right. you, be, you look for yeah. imperfections to see. Now you're looking 
Exactly, and, and I yeah. heard they are, they are introducing that. They are working on, I mean, I, I think we talked actually the other day, but they are introducing imperfection to make it more realistic. Mm. And this one, for example, is a picture, well, picture, I don't know how to call it anyway, anymore, but this is an image that won an award, a photography award in this year. And, and the guy who, who won it at the end, like, uh, not at the end, but when he got the, 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 the award, it's, he didn't accept it because it, he just explained it was all image generation, AI generated. Because the thing is, it was completely AI generated. It's not that he used it to, I don't know, put the girl in the background. It's just 100% AI generated. So yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about the future because if we saw this coming in 12 months, uh, super difficult to imagine what, what's coming, you know? Mm. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, it's fast. You know, it's yeah, you know, it's kind of scary fast. Yeah, yeah, and we are actually improving the. Right now, we've been using uh, generating images with text, but right now we are extending the the input to, for example, uh, we can now orientate the generation based on on a schema of the pose of the person. So, if you want to be cross uh, with the whichever pose you want, actually. You can draw that in paint, basically, and you can upload that photo with the text you want, and the output will have that that exact uh, pose. And this can be also be applied to to, to um, landscapes or something like that. You want a tree in a, in a place or something like that. You can control how the output is going to be. Huh. So it's not only text that right now. <laughs> Crazy. Well, then, Gordon, you... Um... I have, you guys can't see that well because it's blurred my background, but that's an Andy Warhol print um, blonde. Yeah. I love, <laughs> I love Andy Warhol. And so that's a blondie print back there, but you were seeing something about that in the news, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, a case where uh, uh, fair use of um, is Andy Warhol and, and uh, Prince, but it, they, they made some, um, they, they see it as a way, they, they did a ruling on AI generated um, um, art. And so now you can't get a copyright for, for art that has been solely uh, generated by AI. Um, you, just, you can't do it. You, if you do go to get a, a copyright, you need to be able to prove that there's a significant hu human authorship to it, so that it was a such as, it can be assisted by AI, but it can't be generated by AI. And so then there's going to be some level of, you know, well, what what does what is uh, significant human authorship mean? And I'm sure there's going to be some back and forth for that. Yeah. So I just goes so you can you can develop images and you can do them really well and use them on your sites and stuff. But you have to understand that you may not you may it may not be copyright material. You can't protect it if if you're looking to to save that you, you're not able to of course get a copyright and have that be a, um, you're definitely capable of using it you just can't say that it's yours mm -hmm. it makes sense yeah so yeah. The, the same thing's happening with with code so for instance with copilot since it was trained on yeah, private the repositories from GitHub. Yep, yep. <laughs> Not only the public ones, but the private yep. also. So there's there's a lawsuit, a class action suit against them. Actually, what's funny is the same the same uh, um, firm that was was working in the Andy Warhol case. They're representing a uh, set of, of people going against Copilot because of the the you know they authored some some open source code and that's what it's using and all of its recommendations are based on. It's going to be interesting what happens because really, you know, with, with art, everything's, everything's borrowed from somebody else. You know, there's only a, there's only a rare few that actually come up with something that's new and never been done before. It's, it's more of the innovation is the innovation of how you use what's currently there in a, in a new and, it may be a novel way. Uh, same with, with coding. There's there's uh, a ton of code that's been used 
and probably a lot of code that that may be independently um, developed, but have have uh, the same characteristics. So it's going to be interesting how those those kind of things iron out. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm just looking at um, I don't know one thing that that you we hear about automation in general, not just with AI, but in general, is automation is going to take jobs, right? And that could be a fear people have in more like blue collar endeavors, like in factories and things like that. But that can also be a fear someone could have in my role who's writing or someone could have, um, you know, Peyton and I both, um, you know, design stuff. And I mean, and then you guys develop and code and stuff like that. And so, but then I think ignoring it doesn't mean it, it won't happen. And so are hmm. there ways you think, cause I've been a little bit resistant to be honest, other than hosting this um, and thinking about how I can incorporate it. But are there ways you think are good for people to like incorporate AI into their workday or into their life that maybe will reduce their fear, but also like lead to productivity. I don't know if anyone like, like hmm. Clemente, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I have given this a thought lately, actually, <laughs> not because I'm worried, but you know, and yeah, I don't know. I think that the there will be a lot of job losses. I think that's for sure. I mean, it happened with every single like technology revolution that had always, uh, um, but of course there will be also new jobs at the same time. So I, I think this, uh, the key here is embrace the change, I would say. Uh, and most people will need to, at least people that may be affected by this should need to think about you know, reskilling and retraining themselves probably. And retraining could mean just learning how to use AI because at the end, I guess, in many cases, may, there there be jobs that will disappear, but in many cases, it will be jobs that are, are, will be a lot more efficient, let's say, because AI will take all these mundane tasks, will do like a bunch of things that in just a few seconds, and we will have more time to do more like the creative side of things, like the thinking side of things. So I think it will be it will be inter interesting how that develop and how especially how companies use it, how societies use it. Because if you think it on one way, it's like we are working now. Uh, like we, we are working now as a kind of a society we're kind of working with the jobs we have so if suddenly we have an improvement where which would allow us to do the same thing in less time that would be really interesting to see you know like all these uh, four days a week experiment that are happening around the world like weeks like work week with only five days no four days a week and i think i don't know i'm really excited to see if we can take advantage and use the AI in favor of the society instead of just in favor of the companies or people with money, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to point out that few years back, our first thought about the changing jobs was that uh, robots will replace the hard work when you are farming or something like that. And we end mm -hmm. up replacing the other side. <laughs> thing is, <laughs> how we end up everything, I think is. Not cool, but <laughs> yeah. Well, especially, can you think of? Uh, so AI is trained upon a body of knowledge that was developed by independent thinkers or, or or people, basically. So, so if you don't have anybody that's that's doing that kind, of, so you have nobody generating new data and content, then all you have is AI regurgitating what it's already mm. what it's already done. Yeah, yeah true. Well, um, I think this has been great. I think we'll, we should bring Peyton back and see if there's any questions that um, anyone has. Um, so, cool. Yeah. Hey, Peyton, welcome back. Hi. Hello. Um, so I guess our, the question that I have would be, does, does the trend with AI and the fear that some people have around it remind you of any other technology changes that have happened in the past? It seems like some things come up and people try to ignore them and other people try to embrace them. So is there, does that remind you of anything that's happened in the past? I think yeah. it's hard to tell because mm. I think even in the industrial revolution, it's never been that fast. 
Mm. And I can mm. think yeah, of any that has been yeah. in terms of three years. It's always a decade as, as shorter. So I think it's, it's really, really hard to think about that. We can think about tools like calculators you mentioned before, Clemente, or maybe tools like Photoshop or, or Excel or Microsoft Suite, but not that drastically like AI. Not sure if you guys have any other point of view or any other examples. Um, I was actually going to say that uh, there have been examples, but now that you say this, actually, I'm with you there. <laughs> there have never been something like this, probably. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say it's, it's kind of analogous to, to uh, you know, when you when you go pursuing a computer science degree, everybody had to learn how to write an operating system. But you know, in in reality. There's very few people that actually write an operating system because we just leverage what we already have. Mm -hmm. I think this is this is the next step of leveraging, um, you know, building upon. Uh, you, you should be able to be able to build upon AI, and then um, you know, the, where the worth comes in is being able to to use that to to produce something. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, it seems like the is just crazy. But. Yeah. I mean, the thing I can think of is like retail and just kind of. And even cosmetics, like there's these, um, you guys probably, I don't know. I don't know what you guys search for. Maybe you get it, Peyton, you probably do that. There's like these makeup ads where they'll be like, oh, get your perfect color match from home. And it actually is pretty good. But then it's like, at some point you still need to go to a store usually, or you order the wrong thing and send it back. And then it just ends up being easier to go to the store to get something. Or like my mom insists, like it's easier to go and try and close rather than get them at home. But then I'll just get them at home. And I think there's like this push and pull with the retail that, that, and then during COVID, it was all delivery. We couldn't go into stores, but now people are going back in. And so there's, I don't know, there's, that's the thing I can think of the most is around, which I hate shopping, but that's the most thing I can think of, <laughs> you know. All right. And then our last question, I guess, would be um, what excites each of you the most about the, uh, about the possibilities of integrating AI into work or even your personal lives? Um, that's a good one. Uh, I think, in my case at least, personally, um, I'm pretty excited about how we can integrate that. I mean, part of that was the POC that we did, and lately I'm pretty much excited about how this can change search in general. I think, or I don't know if we mentioned last week, but the fact that it was, it, it was with um, Google before about you learn how to Google thing and now you Google everything. Um, I'm excited to see how this evolving kind of in that same way. Maybe in the future we will say we AI or whatever, I don't know how to say it, but uh, you know, we chat GPT or just chat GPT for me or for you, you know? I think that's uh, what, what really excites me about this. Yeah. I, I see, you know, what I find exciting. So one of the things that I I did, uh, you know, my great, 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 great niece is having a, a birthday party, her first birthday party. And, and instead of bringing a, a, a bringing a, a, a card, you're supposed to bring a children's book. Well, so then, then uh, I decided to go one step further and write a children's book with Chad GPT. And what was, what was really great is it being a good editor. Uh, you know, if I if I was to to create a book, I would have to hire an editor. I'd have to hire an illustrator, and I was able to get a book off the ground and and put together. Even though I was only doing it for her, I ended up it published it out on Amazon, and and uh, so it's it's out there. But it wouldn't be out there if I had to go, um, you know, track down all these other things that I'm not good at. And so sometimes it can it can uh, give you a lot more power um, in getting something out the door. That's that's a cool gift. Just <laughs> I yeah, it, it, it surprisingly yeah. takes way more time than I than I you know it's like oh well this is a great idea just throw something together. No, I can't just throw it together. I had to no. I spend a lot of hours uh, trying to get it just right. Yeah, I'm kind of jealous. I made a book for my nephew and he's gonna he's 18 now, but I made it when he was little and it was um Gumby, Gumby's European adventure. And I took a Gumby 
like bendable doll and put them everywhere, like in France and stuff. And then oh. had to do it on Snap. But it took a long time, so you got away with it. You know, you got away with it easily. Yeah. <laughs> No. To be honest, I have no idea what to answer to this because right now, in, the, in my current work, we have already ChatGPT uh, with Copilot. We are partially covered there. <laughs> mm -hmm. But in my personal life, I'm not really thinking about one use case I will need. Probably if there will exist, I will need that. But as for now, I'm fine with what I have. <laughs> Yeah. So I cannot think of any, I mean, we already have Alexa if you need an assistance, but you can uh, do this open, this open list talking to, to her. Oh, it's going to, to pop. <laughs> Don't say too loud. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm, once a uh, cool cat gets its, its offer, she's going to get a lot more about AI, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, she's already For doing now, it's, it's my tool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I guess for me that I think I, I like, I didn't ever think I'd need the timer on the echo. I'm not going to say her name, uh, but I use that all the time, but I don't use that much stuff on there. And I think I'm almost going to stay old for a little while and just use Google, just like I still use Facebook for some things, you know? So, um, but I'll, I'll probably use it for something at some point. I tried to look up how, like, if it knows about me, I said, you know, tell me about Rabia. And then it says, this doesn't know I exist. So I thought that's a bit sad, you know. Um, but yeah, <laughs> don't know what I'll use it for yet. You didn't start comedy in 2021, did you? Well, my friend, oh my God, my friend. That's true. I started a little bit before that. My friend who is a pro comic, he looked up about, tell me about him, his name. I'm going to say his name. And then it said it, did, it said it didn't know about him. And then we asked it again. And then it said he had been on the Tonight Show and all this stuff, like wild things. And he hadn't done it. I thought, well, this is a cooler guy than I thought that I'm hanging out with. <laughs> <laughs> he said it makes up stuff. So I don't know. Maybe I'll use it to lie. That could be what I'll use it for. All right. I heard a guy, uh, he, he prompted a chat GPT to, to be sarcastic and, and uh, is a sarcastic advisor or something. So, so every time he asks a prompt, it, it comes out with some snarky, some snarky <laughs> response. <laughs> God. All right. Thank you everyone for attending today. Um, you can follow our LinkedIn community for updates on future webinars and our blog posts. Um, so thanks again and have a great rest of your day. Thank you everyone for being a part of the panel. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a good week. Bye. Bye. Bye.